So today we're going to talk about responsible conduct of research. And um, it's a bit of a mixed bag of topics that touches ethics and um, science, reproducibility, replicability, questionable research practices. This is the QRP that you see there. And of course, possible solutions, because it's good to identify problems, but it's also good to you know, solve the issues. I'm Enrico Glerian, maybe 30 seconds about myself. So I'm a data agent for the Alter Search Services. I'm a technical expert on personal data for research, so GDPR and those issues. I worked a lot with data anonymization, reproducibility, open science, and these type of things. And here you will find the link that I was sharing with you about this, um, these uh, future trainings that are, that are coming. I'm also a core member of Alta Scientific Computing, Science IT, where we organize lots of um, uh, hands-on computational uh, programming language and that type of stuff. And um, my background is in neuroscience, and I still do some uh, neuroscience in my spare time. Specifically, I'm uh, in functional magnetic resonance imaging. And when it comes to reproducibility, I'm one of the founders of the Finnish Reproducibility Network that I will mention later in the presentation. So outline of today's workshop. Mm, so I think it's good to first start on what is responsible conduct of research, also known as research integrity, and especially kind of what is the research misconduct, because it's, uh, it's easier to identify responsible conduct by identifying when things can go wrong. And of course, we should ask ourselves, why do we care? Why do we need to you know, be responsible with, uh, with our research. And of course, also try to find reasons why researchers engage with unethical research practices. And finally, is there a way to fix these things? So the focus, of course, here we are in Finland and we followed the, the recommendations of the TENG, which is the National Board on Research Integrity. And of course, we also follow recommendations for, from the EU uh, level. But of course, you understand that uh, the topics that you find here can be can be applied to other countries and um, and even not specifically to scientific research or academic research, but also you know in uh, companies and in other outside. So as I mentioned already, the link to the slides that you have, it, you can actually write comments. So there's always a way to improve the slides with more content or we better resources so please take time to read the slides and add comments if you have any so to just start with some references as i mentioned the tank they provide lots of materials and there's specifically the 2012 uh, uh, guidelines on responsible conduct of research that i highly recommend to read if you if you're a researcher in finland and then um, the workshop will kind of focus on uh, or like things that I will touch, I will mention this reproducibility. Most of the focus is on quantitative methods and specifically I'm using uh, materials from Dorothy Bishop workshop on uh, the reproducibility crisis and what we can do about it. But of course, the same issues apply also with qualitative research. And so I've added also some reference kind of similar to what I'm gonna talk about, but from the kind of qualitative methods perspective. I also highly recommend you, if you work at Alto, to read our Alto Open Science Research Policy, which you know is not uh, a law, but it's a, it's a recommendation on how you can consider openness and transparency in all the steps of your of your research project. And finally, there's a nice review on research misconduct that I recommend to check if you want to go deeper. And um, and the last one, the Turing Way book, it's uh, excellent open online book that covers all these topics and also reproducibility and replicability and data management and, and much more. All right, so what is responsible conduct of research? So responsible conduct of research touches multiple topics, such as ethics and law and the philosophy of science. So as you might know already, ethics is not law. In the ideal world, the law would match with ethics to respect and basically, you know, fulfill the, the requirement of ethics. But in practice, sometimes, depending on the country where you are, there might be laws that are 
highly unethical. If on top of this we add science, you can understand that sometimes scientists can be, or ideally scientists would like to be in the spot where science is ethical and lawful, but sometimes scientists might decide to do something that is ethical, even though the law would kind of forbid it, or worse, maybe that scientists would still respect the law, but are going to do something unethical. So of course the boundaries between these three areas are not are not clear and it's very difficult to define you know where is the right spot and which thing falls in which part of this uh, intersection so in general i find it challenging to define responsible conduct of research as you know the sentence do unto others as you would do as you would have done as you would have them do unto you so i find it is easier to define basically by stating what is not responsible conduct of research which brings us which leads us to the research misconduct and the questionable research practices once we all agree on what is deemed as research misconduct then we can identify ways to fix it and also prevent it and basically incentivize the researchers towards practices that are against the misconduct all right so what is research misconduct now, if we stick to the TENC 2012 guidelines and similar definitions are also in other countries, not just in EU, there are four types of research misconducts and um, they're usually listed as a fabrication, which basically means that you generated data that, you know, false data, data that did not exist and, um, you know, invented for a specific purpose falsification which is basically similar to fabrication but it's more about generating false findings false results and then plagiarism which is stealing of others materials and misappropriation which is not exactly like like plagiarism but it's more about that you might uh, steal someone else's idea or do claim that it's your work even though some of your students actually actually did it then, of course, research misconduct of, touches also issues related to ethics, so to the ethicality of the research conducted. In general, if, you, if you've been doing research, you might know that research ethics is basically helping us to prevent any harm caused to the research subjects, so to the humans, for example, that you might study, or animals, or the environment, society, and also to the researchers themselves. So if you think, for example, that one of these uh, you know, topics could be affected, could be harmed by your research, even if yourself could be harmed, then it's good to conduct this uh, kind of ethic review. It's also nice to, to notice that um, there are not just these topics that are kind of the standard topics of ethic, ethics review, but also one should consider when research is carried in non-EU countries, or recently artificial intelligence and ethics have been questioned. So ESC University has now a committee on this topic, artificial intelligence and ethics, and also dual use when a technology or when um, a study, an idea could be used for military purposes, which basically leads us to the export control as well as sanctions when there are sanctions with uh, certain countries that, that, that basically forbid collaborations in these other types of export but of course like while misconduct and ethicality of the research are really important and we can easily identify those or well not too easily but at least there is a way to identify those mispractices things get a little bit more difficult to identify when we think for example of academic publishing so when you think of arming others other scientists other others research war for your own profit for example ignoring the literature being unethical in peer review manipulating citation metrics or having conflict of interest that are not that are not declared in a, in a paper so all these things might happen and these are much more difficult to to spot you know there is no law that would put somebody to jail because you ignore some literature but uh, you know sometimes it can be an honest mistake that you didn't know that somebody did what you claim that is new or but sometimes it can be a malicious thing that you uh, voluntarily ignore a previous study just to just to claim that you you made something novel 
And of course, this leads to the misleading of the general public. This is very correlated with the false findings that you might find something that, you know, maybe it's not false in a sense that you, you didn't fabricate it, but it's false in a sense that it doesn't reproduce. So you were just lucky to have found something, but the in practice has zero value because nobody can reproduce it. Reproduce it. And that, of course, you know, can can cause harm to the general public as well to, to the future studies that will try to replicate your find. And so all these kind of terms and all this type of uh, you know misconduct that is a bit more difficult to define, they often are called questionable research practices, which we'll cover soon. And there are basically they, they can touch the methods, but also they can be related to the biases that we have as uh, as researchers, but also simply as, uh, as humans. So if we go back again to our, you know, Venn diagram of overlapping ethics and law and science, we clearly see that the scientific misconduct as the falsification, fabrication, and leisureism and uh, misappropriation falls, you know, it's unethical and it's also illegal. And there are tools for dealing with the kind of official scientific misconduct. Things get a little bit more difficult with the questionable research practices because you know the law is not saying that you're doing anything wrong by using the wrong statistical method, for example. And maybe you, you know, scientifically you, you know, other people have used that method, even though it has been proved that to be wrong. But in practice, it, when it comes to the ethics, and here it's not the ethics towards the subjects or the animals or the environment, it's the ethics towards science. Is the ethics towards other scientists, other researcher, then we have an issue here because by engaging in these questionable research practices, we are actually damaging uh, the future of, of science. Of course, we don't need to cover all the examples here, and you yourself can think of, of others, but you know, the sweet spot where that we're all aiming is to be ethical, legal, and also in kind of doing the good science and, and the good for the science. All right, so I usually tend when this workshop is done more interactively, we now stop and ask which one would be the worst. Of course, they're all as bad, but personally, I think that falsification and fabrication are the worst because you, you really create you know, data from nowhere and then claim it that it's your finding. And the, the issue is that it might be very difficult to detect, even though now there are technologies to spot when the data is too good to be true. But in general, there's many past studies that were not, you know, that they're still accepted findings and it gets very difficult to, you know, accept that those studies were false and that we should move on and rethink theories or experiments and other findings. If you're interested in these topics of misconduct, there is a nice paper that I linked here, which it's a really extensive kind of taxonomy of all the types of misconduct. So it, it touches more or less what I've covered here, but with a, in a much deeper, in much deeper detail. All right. So now the reflection, like we understand what ethics wants us and what research misconduct is. But now we should start thinking what should be considered research misconduct in 2022. So now, basically, we would have you, you can think that there is a continuum of integrity from full integrity, full like ideal case of good research practices, where here it's the green, to the really bad ones that can be that can be defined for fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. So of course, what sits in the middle in this gray area, you know, they're not uh, called, you know, misconduct, but they're still so-called questionable research practices. Sometimes they might be unconsciousness that, that might happen because of unconscious biases or because of sloppy practices with the data management or with research methods. Uh, but sometimes there can be also some malicious intent so that there is actually uh, a will to kind of, I wouldn't say cheat, but a will to not follow the best practices to obtain, you know, publications and citations and whatever are the metrics to advance in academia. 
So some example of honest mistakes, if somebody just tells you that a correlation between two variables is 0 0.8, you can think that it's a high one, but without looking at the data, you have no idea if you are in one of these four cases. So this is one of, this is Colin's com quartet, is one of those typical cases to, to show to students, for example, that it's important to visualize those numbers, how you obtain those numbers, so that you can basically check in this case if the assumptions of the correlation are, are met, then the two variables are you know, distributed with some kind of level of variance, or if, or if it's like this case with just one outlier and no other, no effect. And this is, you know, not visualizing your data would be a sloppy mistake. It's like uh, we can accept it maybe from a, from a young researcher who is learning, but in general, it should, these things should not happen. Another thing that recently, in the past maybe three years, it became more visible that often you might see the reporting of, um, of findings with these bar charts. And again, here, yeah, there's lots of assumptions that, uh, you know, the data is basically normal and that just reporting the mean and the um, standard error of the mean would be enough. But in practice, as you can see here, there's many type of situations which could lead to the same type of bar chart. So hiding the data behind the bars might also cause difficulties in understanding what's going on, especially if somebody's trying to replicate your, your findings. And then some other type of paradoxes. This is the Simpson paradox. Again, if you don't visualize your data, you might think you have a negative correlation, but actually there's some stratification happening in the data that there's, in this case, whatever, five subgroups that if one would analyze them separately, would actually find that there's a positive, positive correlation between these two, these two numbers. So, now for this, it's difficult, of course, to build a taxonomy of questionable research practices also because they can be field dependent. And as I said, you know, it's, it's, it's a gray area. It's, it's also, it might be related that, okay, there's a method that has been used for many years and people are still using it just because it has been used for many years, even though we know that we should stop using that, that statistic method or whatever method. So here I use, I mentioned these four types that are coming from a, from a lecture of um, Professor Dorothy Bishop from Oxford. And um, the full lecture is linked there. There's also a video. So if you want to go deeper into this uh, type of questionable research practices, you can check the source. So the first type of questionable research practices are the so-called problems caused by the researchers. And this can be, you know, some sort of a bias, like, like as we, as Dr. Bishop says, kind of seeing the Jesus on toast. You know, this is just a fine, this is just a random coincidence that this toast, this slice of toast has, looks like that there's the face of, a, of Jesus. But in practice, you know, if we are so much into our own research and we want to see a pattern, we're going to see it. It's the confirmatory bias, even though the pattern actually is not there. And of course, claiming that we saw the pattern that we were expecting leads to our irreproducible findings. Or worse, it might lead to the file drawer effect. So that um, in the file drawer effect would mean that because you're trying to replicate someone else's results and you obtain the opposite, now you must, you start questioning, you know, okay, why am I not able to replicate some excellent finding from that was published in nature? And so then you will never publish your, your result because it goes against the whatever most prestigious finding in your, in your field. But maybe actually it should be published because maybe the most prestigious one was wrong and you are the right one. So the solution that I suggest is that we should eradicate subjectivity from the methods. So in some fields, they even have that some people collect the data and other people analyze the data. You can even kind of mask the, the research question that you don't even tell them what they're supposed to see in the data collected. And of course, Another solution to kind of eradicate the subjectivity from methods is to make data and methods open so that other people can reuse the method and maybe find potential you know, biases that, that we introduce when we want to see patterns that are not there. The second type of group of questionable research practices is the kind of is related to the methods and specifically to statistics. 
statistics, of course, is not used in all the fields of science, but there's many fields, especially related to health science and psychology and uh, other, you know, basically when often we work with, uh, with human subjects that we need to set a threshold if an intervention, if, an eff if there is an effect, is there is a statistical significant in whatever finding that we claim that we have found. So in general, the questionable research practice leads to p-hacking. So the idea of p-hacking is that you might try multiple analyses or as they call them fishing expeditions up to the point that you are able to find the magic p-value that is lower than 0 0.05 so that you can claim statistical significance and publish and you know be cited and advance with your academic career so in general of course you can understand that there are many false positives that are published some people some excellent people say that 50 percent of what is published is actually false so 50 percent of all the p-values of the significant p-values that you've seen in papers they're actually not replicable, they're actually false positives. And of course, there are publication, by like consequent publication biases, like the problem with Harking, which is um, uh, a hypothesis after the results are known, so that basically you would collect some data without telling anyone, analyze the data, st start your fishing expedition so that you get the p-value lower than 0 0.05, and then you pretend that you had an hypothesis before actually collecting the data. And it's exactly the hypothesis that you tested that you found significant. So it's like cheating in the scientific method process. Then instead of having an hypothesis first, collecting the data after and testing the hypothesis, you fish for something significant in some data, and then you invent the hypothesis based on your false positive. And then of course, on the opposite side, there's the file drawer effect that unfortunately you're not able to replicate the false positives that some other have found and then you never publish the negative effect the the you know that will stay in your file drawer and science will will not advance because of that here is a nice figure from the Dorothy bishop uh, talk in uh, this is called the garden of forking parts so this helps us to understand statistics so let's imagine that they want to compare a group of um, attention disorder versus typical uh, population subjects, human subjects. And you know, if you would do the whatever, the statistical test at this point, you will compare all the people with the uh, attention disorder versus all the typical people. You have a probability of finding a significant value equal to 0 0.05, basically. So you know, five percent but the more you start picking you know that okay instead of focusing on uh, you know you might start splitting them versus old versus young so it's basically finding subgroups so you focus only on the young people you focus only on the whatever skills you focus only on the females and you focus only on those that live in urban areas then you're basically the probability of finding by chance something that is significant of increases so that at, at the end when you go to all these subgroups you have more than 50 percent of probability of finding one 0 0.05 significant you know and of course again if you would have a strong hypothesis that is the young uh, hand skill females living in urban areas that are really your research group then you can claim it before trying all the possible you know comparisons that you can do here and, and fishing for the for the magic 0 0.05 p-value. Of course, the multiple comparisons problem that I introduced here is just one of the problem. We talk about foil file drawer problem, pseudo replication, which is also interesting in itself that you might measure something that is meaningless, but you measure it consistently. So replicating something that is useless, it's it's useless. <laughs> so having a, you know, so replicating something that doesn't really help it's not a success it's uh, it's it's bad science then um, here is kind of the fishing expedition significant quest testing then uh, in general all this data mining dredging torturing you know of course i'm not like you can read all the others but i'm not saying that people should stop doing exploratory research 
it's nice to mine data, look for patterns, but then one has to think it more in a kind of machine learning perspective that you want, you might want to mine data, find patterns, but you do it on half of the data set or you do it on one data set. And then you have another data set for testing that what you, that you're mining your exploration, your fishing expedition actually is replicable with the, with another half of the data set or with a completely different data set. This is a nice article where I took this number of uh, studies that would all have this type of questionable research practices and methodological issues. So what is the solution for this type of whatever statistics and methodological issues? Well, people claim for you know using larger n so um, larger number of subjects, for example, in uh, when you work with human participants, so that, uh, as I said earlier, you can actually separate a replication data set from the data set that you have, or also using simulated data. Once you understand the pattern of the data, you can actually augment the data, make bigger data set, and test better your hypothesis. Or then, ideally, working with other people. So for example, in this blind analysis, with mass data, you give the data to someone else without telling exactly what's in there, and you know they are less biased than you in uh, in uh, seeing what might be in the data. Another solution is the pre-registration or register reports, with the idea being that you start from an hypothesis, you read the literature, and you see a research gap. You claim your hypothesis, and you claim the methods that you can use to test it. And you you tell this kind of you know you 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 tell this claim to the reviewer. So you you didn't collect the data, you didn't analyze the data, but you have a strong hypothesis and the methods that you should use. And then your paper, the register report, can go through peer review. If the reviewer think that your hypothesis is good and the method is good, you will get an acceptance in principle, which would basically mean that your paper is accepted. The only thing you need to do now is collect the data run the analysis that you promised and publish whatever finding you you might have found so you understand that here now there's a higher chance of publishing something that is that is not statistically significant but that's okay because multiple experts not just you have have kind of agreed that the data collection process and data analysis process was good that the hypothesis was good and then they were just waiting to see okay what do we get after this of course this is, again it's not a a cage that does not allow you to explore the data. Maybe you realize in the analysis stage that you that both you and the reviewers forgot to, to consider one confound. So you can still have that confound. You can still publish a significant finding with more exploratory data, but still, you know, it's clear that the hypothesis came before the data was, was actually collected. All right, then the third problem which open science tries to kind of address a bit is the data secrecy. And not just data secrecy, also method secrecy. So the fact that, you know, people say that data is available on reasonable request. What is reasonable request? Is it that it's available only to the people who think like you, who are gonna cite you because they agree with you, or is it available to anyone, even to your, you know, academic enemies, if we can say something like that. So data secrecy, unfortunately, and also method secrecy arms transparency and, um, and of course, arms science. In general, there are good reasons to keep the data secret. So sometimes it's simply impossible, if not always, it's simply impossible to anonymize data. So if you work with human research data, individual data, this is a nice paper from a couple of years ago where they showed that with just 15 pieces of information about an individual, like the zip code and, and uh, whatever, gender, date of birth, how many cars you have, how many children you have, it's enough to re-identify almost 100% of the America, American population. So we understand that we have an issue in sharing data that is, that is about individual, that is a bit more sensitive, but that shouldn't be an excuse to not share the data. So we are figuring out and there are already ways of opening even the data that often we claim that cannot be shared. In general, this is work in progress because the European Data Protection Board is still discussing on this type of 
sharing issues, but Finland is actually an excellent country where things like the secondary use of social and health data and uh, new services that are coming like the CSC sensitive data services will actually enable this uh, you know opening of the or not fully open because it's not going to be publicly open but the the to facilitate the reuse of um, sensitive data personal data that has been used in a in a in a study and then finally the fourth category is basically the problems that are related to your scientific field in general what are you measuring in some cases the quantity that you measure is very clear you measure i don't know speed and there's a you know mathematical formula to calculate speed and you can actually measure but when you start you know measuring i don't know pain or such psychological constructs or other you know more vague things related to human then we start having the measuring issues and so the so-called questionable measurement practices which kind of goes hand in hand with the small effect sizes so that the phenomenon that you study might have a very tiny effect which basically means that you will need thousands of subjects or millions of subjects to see a tiny statistical significance so of course this is nothing new if you've been studying a uh, concept of measurement latent factors whatever that that type of uh, field but in general it's it's still persistent that uh, people might claim that they are measuring whatever psychological uh, mental construct but in practice it's uh, you know it's something that is that is it, it, it's a quantity that doesn't that doesn't really make sense so that is not correctly measured so people again claim for more robust theory thinking in advance of hypotheses that are more robust and then kind of making sure that we measure what we claim to measure there are a couple of interesting reading here on uh, one is by Lackens, which is one of the statisticians who kind of has been lots involved in this type of issues on why hypothesis tester should spend less time testing hypotheses and basically working more on theory and thinking more of the concepts and uh, you know the kind of building ideas not just from the data but but from actually theory and also in general which this relates to the effect size that sometimes the question of research practices that i've said that i show earlier like um be, be hacking or hacking or whatever, sometimes they have little effect on replicability, meaning that sometimes what I just told you, that is not the issue. The issue is that you're studying something that has a, an effect that is almost zero. You're studying a phenomena that is kind of, you know, that there's so much noise that it's impossible to be measured. So once again, one needs to rethink the, the actual thing that you're studying, not just the methods or not just a statistical method or some bias that, that you might have. All right, so we are basically done. And this is the summary of this uh, questionable, research questionable research practices for you. Now we could basically spend a few minutes of thinking, you know, why do we care? And uh, why do people engage? Why do especially researchers engage in uh, questionable research practices? So maybe the root of the problem is the so-called reproducibility crisis uh, most published research findings are false as your need is, has been saying since you know soon 20 years ago looking even you know this is i'm not really talking about the small field of science the most prestigious uh, journals or the most prestigious even companies that are studying let's say cancer and drug or cancers you know we have 64 percent of studies that are not able to to replicate and this is of course a big issue because here we are talking about studies on new drugs promising drugs that should actually become you know potentially be sold and used so in general the replicability crisis is everywhere not just in health sciences there are these numbers are a bit old old in the sense that you know they are older than two years old but uh, there is no field that is suffering from the reproducibility crisis so in general if you're not familiar if it's the first time that you hear about the reproducibility crisis we have an excellent uh, talk part of our series on reproducibility and replicability but one definition of the issue is that 
something that is reproducible is when you reuse the same data and the same kind of methods code here and you can get the same number so this is you know the reproducibility is more like an exercise that you can replicate for example what you calculated six months ago and trust me <laughs> this is not as trivial as it sounds but of course there are you know computational tools that help you in making sure that even in one year you can rerun the same data through the same num methods and still get the same numbers and then things of course get more interesting when you get a different data like a second data set that you kept you know for like a test data set and use the same code then you know that what you find is replicable so that also on another data set you still get the same finding and this is quite good because you know that you know maybe there is some truth in in what you found then they also define robust when the same data might go through a different method and you still get the same finding this is also very very good because it means that there is not the bias of the specific method that you're using that also other methods are still able to find whatever phenomena and the last one is basically where kind of physics is it's maybe the only discipline where where they are so that different data set and different methods they still give you you know a generalizable finding a concept that you can almost write down as a formula that you can really predict what given the data what could be the the outcome so as a as an example i was one of the 70 teams that um, analyzed some brain imaging data this was published in nature a couple of years ago and out of the 70 teams not a single team had the same analysis everyone used different selection of pre-processing strategy and tools etc however the findings were quite robust because still 75 percent so this is a, a similarity matrix where every kind of row and column is a is a team and so they, you can kind of see the similarity of the findings between let's say team one and team 15. so if it's red the similarity was very high if it's blue they're actually anti-correlated so that this team here and this team here actually they found the opposite and so the biggest majority almost 80 percent of all the teams found the same things found the same brain areas with the same effect sizes of course it's still worrying that you know some some small percentage of teams find exactly the opposite but but in general you know this also makes us understand how useful it is to for example work on the same data across multiple uh, multiple teams that everyone can use their own methods and then together at the end you can pull kind of you know a sort of a meta-analysis of uh, of all the findings to see you know what what is true in the, what is the real kind of effect in the in the data that you have um so in general if we can end here there's some bonus materials in the slides there's a page at auto.fin how to get started with reproducibility um, with interesting links and actual practical uh, help and uh, i recommend again our series on research data management and specifically here because i mentioned these issues of replicability how to make your code replicable and again, the Turing Way book covers all these topics with other excellent links. And the Finnish Reproducibility Network, if you're in Finland, you can join as a person who is interested in these issues. And we meet once every other month to openly discuss about these things and if we can create you know, awareness and events and whatever we can do. And Code Refinery, it's an excellent network that spans across the Nordic countries where you can learn about all these topics, especially with a kind of more computational uh, point of view. Finally, we should think and we should reflect, I don't have answers here, why do researchers engage in unethical research practices? So I think, or many people think that the issues are the incentives. A sensational story is more important than honest result because you know it's the sensational findings that is going to go to nature of science and the boring science that just is incremental and very solid unfortunately doesn't have this wow effect for this uh, big journal so the journals in one sense are also responsible for this replicability issues questionable research practices and uh, and this type of you know integrity research integrity issues that we discussed today <laughs>
questions those practices are often justified in the publisher perish because you know that the metric to measure you is publications and citations and if you know that all your colleagues are using a statistical methods from 100 years ago and they think that it's still good even though kind of everyone silently knows that it's not true that it, that it's producing rubbish but still because you know the, the, the game is about publishing more then people think that they can justify the using of all the outdated methods just because everyone does it and just because everyone publishes with those methods then the issue that we cover of course is the null results are still hidden and they're still not welcomed by peer review so if you're not able to replicate something most likely they think that it's your fault you did not collect the data in a proper way you did not apply the method in a proper way there is too much trust in what has been published even though even though it might be more likely that it's the published result that is wrong and your null finding is actually the true one. So here, registration and pre-registration hopefully would, would kind of try to fix and help the publication of null results. And finally, the COBRA effect. The COBRA effect is when in, in India years ago, they, they had an issue with too many COBRAs. And if you were bringing a dead COBRA, you were going to get uh, money. So what they actually started doing, they started to, you know, raise cobras and breed cobras too, so that, you know, whenever there's a metric, there is a way to manipulate it. So if the metric to get to advance in your academic career is uh, publishing and getting cited, of course, there are ways to, you know, salami slice your, your findings and citing yourself and ask your friend to cite yourself and, and so on. So in general, even though we understand that you know, some people might do, might engage in these questionable research practices because it's the game. But in general, it shouldn't be like that. Incentives must not justify misconduct. Nothing should justify misconduct. There is an excellent blog from a few years ago by Talia Arconi that it's not the issues, it's not the incentives. We shouldn't blame academia or the publishers. We should only blame ourselves that we perpetrate these issues. So, I'm basically done. How can we fix things? And this is now more my opinions, but I think that in general, being transparency, transparency in science in all the full scientific process is the way to go. So is the transparency towards, from the beginning, from the data collection, transparency towards the subject, what data you want from that, why they should consent on data reuse, what are the risks, what are the benefits, transparency towards other science, scientists, sharing the data, sharing the code, the protocols that you've been using for collecting data and the results. And of course, also transparency towards authorities. Anyone should be able to come to your lab and check that everything's fine, that everything is in, you know, that you are following the best practices, whatever they are, because it's us, it's scientists that decide what are the best practices, you know, the, the law, and the ethics in the end, they are guiding us. But once we agree that, for example, transparency in all the research process from the idea to the publication, that everything can be examined, then we know that there's nothing to hide. So maybe the reward should be transparency. Maybe people shouldn't get promotions in academia because of publications or because of citations, but it should actually be because they are really transparent with your with their full process because they can really open everything about the research process you know from the idea to how the idea came out how the data was collected how peer review happened it's also a big issue i didn't touch here that peer review sometimes is often secret also peer review should be published to to avoid this type of biases however what we should not remember is that often all this it, it's lots of work to make everything open, to make everything transparent. And usually it's a word that is given to the, you know, to the doctoral students, unfortunately, to the doctoral candidates. So this should not become a new source of burnout for this, for the young scientists, for the young researchers. We need a strong peer community of people that can support each other. And together we can, you know, start from little steps. So things that I gave earlier, like the code refinery community is where you can start to pick one thing from your process that is not transparent and fix just that, and then move on to the next one. All right, 
I think I'm basically done. There's extra material here in the slides that you can check by yourself. This is kind of some experiment and how we can open all the parts of an experiment. And finally, I want to also mention something. The focus here has been a little bit more for quantitative research methods, but of course, qualitative research methods suffer the, the same issues. And um, also for qualitative research, one can engage in pre-registration so that the protocol of collecting the data and analyzing the data with the qualitative research can also be pre-registered and can also be basically used in a sense that it can be replicated across, for example, different people who do the annotations or the analysis or, or with different you know, group of participants. There's a nice materials here from a workshop in the Netherlands where they exactly consider what I was mentioning. And then for those who like literature research, it's good to think of literature research that are reproducible. This is very common in medical field. This is the PRISMA guidelines for, for basically searching the literature and uh, having a clear process, a reproducible process on you know, finding basically the studies that you should use. But I, I strongly believe that PRISMA guidelines should also be used outside uh, medical sciences that um, every scientific field would benefit if if this you know if searching the database the publication database is done basically automated with with scripts then we know that there's no human bias that will choose to not cite some some studies and then you know then it's it's anyone can basically replicate your your systematic literature review and i think i'm done Thank you for listening.